This presentation provides information regarding cultural selection. The objective for this presentation is to define cultural selection, discuss the relevance of cultural selection in behavioral analysis, describe controversies related to cultural selection, and to provide examples of cultural selection. What is cultural selection? Moore discussed cultural selection on the cultural level. He stated that the cultural level concerns the selection of cultural practices by the environment during the lifetime of the culture. Moore goes on to discuss contingencies that need to occur in order for cultural selection to happen. And these contingencies involve the various practices solving enduring problems related to the welfare and survival of the group as a whole. So not only do we have to find the answers to these problems that are happening, but we also have to act, like, actually practice transmitting the practices to the group members. And so essentially what Moore is saying is that you have to solve a problem that is occurring and not only do you have to solve that problem, but you have to find a way to transmit these practices to the members of the group in order for these changes to occur. So Fogg talked about things that were similar to that, in that in order for cultural selection to happen, there has to be innovation, transmission, and selection. So innovation refers back to the fact that we need to find solutions to problems related to the welfare and survival as a group of, to the group as a whole. So the innovation piece is that finding new ways to do things. And then transmission is the piece that discusses the practices of transmitting the practices to other group members. So figuring out a way for us to come together and work on this different way of doing things. So to work with this solution that we found for the problems that we have when it comes to welfare and survival of the group. And once we find those ways of solving those problems and we successfully transmit those practices to other people in our group, then selection occurs. So we found a new way of doing things, we solved some problems, we've taught our group how to do that, and now because it is more useful or more reasonable, we're able to select that. And so that is when the cultural selection occurs. Here are my examples from the text. So Moore discusses Hunter A. Hunter A has developed a style of hunting that entails approaching prey from the left. Then there is Hunter B who approaches the prey from the right. And when each of them hunts individually, they only capture one, one of the prey. And the other prey escapes out the opposite, opposite direction. And then one day, they ended up hunting together. And during the time that they hunted together, Hunter A went from the left and Hunter B went from the right and because they were able to work together in this way the prey was essentially trapped and they were able to gain access to more prey than they would have independently. So due to the fact that they were able to gain access to more prey they are more likely to hunt together in the future. So the innovation would be the hunters having each their own ideas. The transmission would be when they were able to hunt together. And then the selection would be the increased likelihood that they would be hunting together. Cultural selection is relevant to behavior analysis. Moore states that a culture is selected by its adaptation to an environment and that the practices of a culture may be thought of as operant behavior. 
Glenn discusses interlocking contingencies as the operant behaviors of two or more people that are related to one another in particular patterns. In De Toledo et al. states that it is necessary to use knowledge about behavioral principles with cultural selection. If we look at culture from a behavior analytic perspective, this is a modified graph from Glenn's PowerPoint, and what it shows currently are the first two levels of analysis, the phylogenic and the ontogenic. Culture makes up the third level, or the cultural selection level. When we are analyzing cultural contingencies, what we are looking at are the interlocking behavior contingencies and meta-contingencies. A meta-contingency can be viewed as a contingency of cultural selection, and it involves interlocking behavioral contingencies, which again are the operant behaviors of two or more people that interlock. So these interlocking contingencies can be identified to promote behavior that becomes more or less probable across the group when the group is considered as a whole. So when these two operant behaviors interlock, the consequence of that is reinforcing to the group as an entire whole. Let's look at this diagram again and let's add culture back. It is in this area here that we are talking about interlocking behavior contingencies or the origin of those. So here, operant behavior within individuals is starting to merge and meet the operant behavior of other individuals. This is what's known as cultural selection. From here, cultural selection leads to what's known as a meta-contingency, and the meta-contingencies are what give rise to the new behavior that is formed by the culture and that is reinforcing to the culture. It is important for behavior analysts to understand cultural selection. As cultures extend beyond just the actual operant level or the individual levels that we are the, the, the previous examples have looked through. Cultures are everywhere. They are in our work environment, our home environment, and our play environments. And most often than not, one individual is a member of many cultures. For example, our class itself is a culture, and we may act a little bit differently with our classmates than we would at home, and we would act differently at home in our home culture than we would work or then we would interact in our work culture, which would then again be separate from, say, a religious culture. It's important to remember that culture is not inherited, but it is learned. And because it is learned, it is in order for us to understand the culture, we need to understand and learn the operants through which the culture is learned through, particularly uh, verbal behavior. Our culture also influences how we feel, and people make behavioral choices based on ideal effects. Ideal effect is how a person wishes to feel in comparison to how they currently feel. And that's important sometimes to think about how people wish to feel because their culture may dictate what they can and can't do as far as recreational activities or what they can and can't do in order to feel a certain way, music preferences, and even uh, certain drugs and certain cultures. What one culture might consider to be an illicit drug, another culture may actually consider it to be okay. And so our culture can actually affect what we do and how we and what we do in order to choose how we would like to feel. So let's look at an example of creating a study culture. So this is an example of my independent opera behavior, which is the fact that I use highlighters when I study, but I do not use flashcards. My study buddy's independent opera behavior is that she uses flashcards, but she does not use a highlighter. So when we get together and we study, we come up with using highlighters and flashcards. The combination of the highlighting and Flashcards has become our interlocking behavior contingency as my independent operant behavior of using a highlighter and her independent behavior of using a flashcard have come together. So let's examine this example again in the form of a meta contingency. So when my study buddy and I study together now, we are using both highlighters and flashcards. This in turn leads us to getting higher grades. Our interlocking behavioral contingencies have 
been interwoven enough to that has been reinforcing enough for us to now engage in the behavior of using both highlighters and flashcards to achieve our goal or our cultural consequence of getting higher grades together as study buddies. Just to reiterate the relevance of behavior analysis in cultural selection, Cultural selection is looking at the relationships of an environment with a culture. So how does an environment shape a culture, or does how does a culture shape an environment? There are similarities between operant behavior and meta-contingencies. Operant behavior is looking more on an individual level, whereas a meta-contingency is looking at the behavior as a group and the consequences of the group as a whole. Reinforcement is also important because in order for a culture to have longevity, it must be reinforced in some way, shape, fashion, or form. Social behavior is also very important, and particularly social learning, such as imitation. A lot of the culture's secrets or heritages are passed through social learning. They are also passed through verbal behavior, and operant verbal behavior is central to a culture. And it is through verbal behavior that a culture is replicated, and through replication, it can therefore have longevity. Our next topic that is going to be discussed is controversy on the issue of cultural selectivity. One of the biggest controversies regarding culture, cultural selectivity is culture. Many individuals are uneducated about different ideas and different beliefs from different cultures. It's also possible that many individuals do not want to learn about other cultures, which causes many problems and many different controversies. From her article, Ideal Affect, Cultural Causes and Behavioral Consequences, Jian Tsai states that cultural factors are historically derived and socially transmitted patterns of ideas, including values, norms, and beliefs that are instantiated by practices such as rituals and institutions, such as religion and families. And they are also derived from artifacts such as media that may play a particular important role in determining how people ideally want to feel. Cultural factors also shape what people view as good, moral, and virtuous. So obviously those factors are going to differ from culture to culture. Sai so also discussed that affective states are neurophysiological changes that are often experienced as feelings, moods, or emotions that can be organized in two terms of dimensions, valence and arousal. Jane Thai also studied the ideal affect, or the affective states that people ideally want to feel. Ideal affect involves the evaluation of affective states as positive or negative. However, whereas ideal affect involves the clear ranking or ordering of affective states on the basis of preference, attitudes toward emotion do not. She described the cultural differences and behavioral consequences of ideal affect which is a driving force for many individuals' behavior. Uh, behavioral consequences include people making behavioral choices, consciously or not, based on their ideal affect, including what activities to engage in, what music to listen to, and even what, sub what substances to use. Um, so, for example, so Western indiv or Western slash Americans um, are more likely to engage in high arousal positive behavior, um, such as enthusiast being enthusiastic, excited, or elated. Um, they are also encouraged to place their own needs above others' needs, while those from China, Japan, North and South Korea are more prone to low arousal positive behaviors, such as being calm, relaxed, and pe peaceful. They are also encouraged um, to place 
other people's needs in front of their own, um, specifically those of in-group members above their own, and therefore to adjust or change their own preferences and behaviors to fit in with those of their in-group. So the difference between Western cultures and Chinese and Japanese cultures are very different. So it's very important to understand that even though we may have these differences, um, that we are all still human and we still, we're still all engaging in behaviors. And we all need to be respectful and we need to try to learn about other cultures' behaviors or else we are just going to continue having controversies between different cultures. So another controversy regarding cultural selectivity is religion. Uh, religion may be another way in which individuals learn to want to feel a specific way, um, states Jian Tsai. Um, religions may also socialize their practitioners to value specific effective states explicitly through rituals and texts about how practitioners ought to act or feel or implicitly through sacred writings, paintings, and sculptures that convey models embodying ideal states. I believe the same issue occurs with religion as it did with cultural differences. I feel that individuals are lacking knowledge of other religions and that plays a huge part into the controversy. Um, here in the United States, many or every single person is allowed to express their own religious freedom, uh, and lots of people are ignorant and not very tolerant to other people exercising this freedom, and so this causes a lot of controversial issues. So therefore, it's really important to be open-minded, and even if somebody doesn't believe the same things that you do, that's okay. Everyone is entitled to their own beliefs, which is what is all it's a which is what it's all about. Is that everyone is different. Everybody has different cultures, everybody has different belief systems that they are all entitled to. Okay, so for my example of cultural selectivity, um involved singing and music. So my independent operant behavior is that I'm playing music, but I'm not singing. And then my friend's independent operant behavior is that she's singing, but doesn't have any music. So when they come together, those interlocking behavioral contingencies, um, there is now singing and music. So that is beneficial for the both of us.